man. Well, church, I am really amped to be in the house tonight. I've not come to church since lockdown, but the incredible thing is that I have still been here. And it's all thanks to everybody here that has been serving during this time. Even though we haven't been alongside you or next to you, we still have been able to worship with you. So I'd just like to thank every single one of you that has been serving over this time. It's thanks to you that we've been able to stay connected. Um, you, you have no idea how much that means to so many of us. You know, if anything this pandemic has showed us is how quickly our lives can change, how quickly situations can change, um, the normalities in our lives, the, the hopes we had for the year, the routines we have. As an example, one of the routines I lost during the lockdown was exercise. One of the things in my daily routine was going to gym. And I do that to obviously stay fit and healthy. And it was one of the many things that was stripped away from me over this time. And as I tried to go from a big gym to a small little area in my apartment and from the equipment I had to just being able to use my body weight, I started to feel weaker. But I didn't only start feeling weaker physically, I also started feeling weaker mentally. I couldn't understand it. Simple decisions that were once so easy for me to make became like mountains I had to climb instead of the molehills they really were. Simple decisions like basic work decisions or when to go to the shops or what to buy from the shops or what to eat or when to start cooking or what to watch on TV all became super hard for me to make. I was becoming weaker physically, but I also felt like I was becoming weaker mentally. Why was it that during the most important time where I felt like I needed strength the most, did I feel like I was becoming weaker and weaker daily? Now, I don't know if you experienced this over COVID-19, but research from Columbia University says that a lot of people have. But the research also shows that a lot of people struggle to make basic decisions in times of change in their lives. Why is it that during these times in our lives, when we need that strength the most, does it feel like it's taken away from us? Well, that, that research from Columbia University, they, they, they're looking at what changes happen and what the brain does in those situations. Now, according to the research, scientists say that when we make decisions, we use a part of our brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is also used for remembering. So your brain makes decisions based on past situations or past circumstances. A good example of this in a practical term is buying a pizza. If you go to a new restaurant and you go and read through the ingredients, your brain takes all those different ingredients and it combines them together to tell you whether or not you'll like that pizza. That's also one of the reasons why it can be so hard for us to find a pizza or to make a decision, rather. But what happens when you read through those ingredients and there's an ingredient you don't know? Well, what the brain does is it keeps searching for answers to that question. What, does, what is this ingredient? What does it taste like? And the brain does that in all different situations. So when your life changes or when situations in your life changes, your brain, even though it's something that you do over and over again and it's a basic decision usually, it starts becoming harder because when the brain tries to put it all together, the new situation you're in is different. And that is why that during times of change in your life, whether they're big or small, your brain seems to struggle in some way. So our brains were created this way, <laughs> which means as Christians, we believe that God created them that way, which means he created them that way on purpose. Why would God create our brains on purpose so that in situations and changes, when we feel like we need it the most, <laughs> do we feel so weak? See, I don't think God only created our, way, our brains that way on purpose, but I actually think that he might have made them that way for his purpose. Hear me out here. You see, it's often at my weakest times in my life, 
in the situations where it's so hard for me to, to decide on what to do, when I don't only give it to him and say, God, you know, I actually don't have the answer right now, but I know you do, but I also surrender myself to him. It's during times in our lives when we are feeling weak, when we give and surrender our problems and worries and concerns over to God. And I think that is why God created us that way, because he knows that our weakest moments, at our weakest moments, he knows that we can surrender and give it to him, and he'll be able to guide us and show us where we need to go. A really good example of this um, practically was a couple of weeks ago when Elon Musk, after the SpaceX and Dragon um, crew from NASA came back to Earth, he had a press conference. A man, by the way, who isn't religious, in the press conference said that he prayed for a safe return of the two men. A man who says that religion and science can't coexist admitted that at his weakest moment where he could do nothing else, that he cried out and prayed to God he doesn't even believe exists, but his brain was created that way by God so that at his weakest moments when he can do nothing else, he doesn't look at himself or look at others, he looks at God and asks him for help. He asks him for strength. How crazy is that, that our brains are created that way? There's so many examples in the Bible of how weak people, once they go to God, how they become strong. A really good example of this is Gideon. We're introduced to Gideon when he is portrayed as a weak, timid man who is hiding away and fearful for his life. And we are introduced to him in um, Judges 6, verse 11, when he is threshing wheat in a wine press. And that is the first time we see that Gideon is a weak man. Now, how? Why would that show us that he's a weak man? Well, he was threshing wheat in a wine press, and that was not where you threshed wheat. Threshing wheat was done on threshing floors, and threshing floors were at the top of hills. And the reason why threshing floors were at the top of hills is because you need a little bit of a breeze to thresh wheat. What you would do is you would throw the wheat in the air, and the breeze would separate the husk from the grain, and the grain would fall to the floor. You needed a breeze to separate the husk from the grain. You needed a breeze to successfully and quickly thresh wheat. There was no wind in a wine press at the bottom of the hill. But what we're seeing is Gideon hiding away, weak, in a wine press. Now, why was he hiding away in a wine press? The reason was, was he was hiding away from the Midianites, who the Bible tells us for the last seven years had swarmed through like locusts. The Bible calls them grasshoppers and would leave nothing behind but destruction. They would take everything that the Israelites had created. And that was why we see Gideon hiding away in a wine press. Now, this is also when the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. Now, the Bible tells us the angel appears to Gideon because it's not normal for an angel just to appear right? We don't just walk around and suddenly there's an angel like with us all the time. So the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord appears to him, which is crazy because Gideon is also hiding away in a wine press. But what's also crazy is what the angel says to Gideon during this time. This is what the angel says to Gideon, chapter 12, or rather chapter 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. So let's just hold up one second, right? Gideon is hiding away in a wine press, fearful for his life, when an angel of the Lord appears to him and calls him a mighty man of valor, a strong person, a hero, when he is anything but that. We can see that he's not a mighty man of valor. We know this. So why does God call him that? You see, God calls Gideon a mighty man of valor, because God doesn't see Gideon for what he is or what Gideon feels like he is, no. He calls Gideon by what he knows Gideon is going to become. 
And God does the same thing for you and me. He doesn't call us by what other people call us as or what we feel like we are. He calls us by what He knows and what He created us to become. He doesn't call us by what we feel like we are. He calls us by what He knows we can be. He doesn't call us weak and timid and afraid and shy. He calls us strong and, and beautiful. That is the God we serve. But it's also a person that God created. See, God created us to do incredible works. In fact, let's just go to Ephesians 2.10 quickly. It says, for, our, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, God doesn't call us by what we feel like we are. He calls us by what he has created for us to do. But now listen to how Gideon responds to God when he's been called a mighty man of valor. Judges 6.13, Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. There is no way that you haven't heard this recently. If, if God loved us, then why would this happen to us? Or, God, why me? Why is this happening to me, God? And while we're not going to be getting into answering this question tonight as much as I wanted to, and by the way, if you have this question, I want to encourage you to seek the answer. Come to us and ask us this question, because when you find the answer to this question, why do these things happen to us? You realize just how incredible God's love is for us. Gideon, however, saying this is proving to us that he is weak in this current time. He isn't trusting. He is seeking from God, but he isn't trusting God. Listen to how God's, what God says to him. What we see, by the way, from now on is God convincing him that he is a mighty man of valor. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. Go with the strength you have, Gideon. I see that light in you. I know that you've got strength. Go with that tiny little strength you have and get up. That's what God says to us in those, this moment. He says, I know you have strength. Get up. I see the light in you. Those times when you don't feel like getting up or getting out of bed those weakest moments in your life, and God is shouting at you, get, go, get up, Gideon, go with the strength you have. He says, I'm sending you. That's what he tells Gideon, I'm sending you. And listen to how Gideon responds. But God, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the weakest in my entire family. Gideon is telling us that he's not only the weakest person in his tribe, but his tribe is also the weakest of all the tribes. Yet God says to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Once again, we see how weak Gideon is telling us how weak he is. And, and what we see is God convincing Gideon. But Gideon doesn't believe that God really does think he's a mighty man of valor. So what God does, Gideon does rather, he goes and he gets some food and he brings it back to the angel. Now if I was the angel, I'd eat the food, but the, 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 the angel touches the food with a staff and the food flames in fire and suddenly the angel disappears. Now at this point, after seeing that, you would think that Gideon really does suddenly believe that he is a mighty man of valor because God has just told him he is. I mean, if I told a toddler that they were Superman, they would put their hands in the air and you would see 100% that they believe that they are. And we as humans do the same thing. If God came to us and was like, Ed, you are a mighty man of valor and you're gonna do incredible things, I would go crazy. Everyone would think I was crazy. And you would think Gideon would do the same, but the Bible tells us that we are actually very wrong. Instead, Gideon cries out to God. He says, O oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Listen to what God says to him. 
It's all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. But what Gideon does after this is he continuously tests God. The first thing he does, he takes a fleece, and he says, okay, God, I'm just going to test you one more time. I know that I saw that. You know, I'm going to put this fleece down on the floor, and when I wake up in the morning, the fleece must be wet, but there must be no dew on the land. Gideon wakes up. He walks over to the fleece. Says, it's dry. He thinks that he's, he must have had a dream. He picks up the fleece, and he turns it, and water runs out of the fleece all over the place. But this isn't enough for Gideon. He, bu- he puts the fleece back down on the floor. He says, okay, God, tomorrow, sorry, I'm sorry that I'm testing you again, but tomorrow I'm going to wake up, and the fleece must be dry, and there must be dew all over the land. Gideon wakes up the next morning. He walks over to the fleece, to be towing over the wet ground. He picks up the fleece, and it's completely dry. All of these tests that Gideon is doing really does show us how weak he seems to be. He really does seem to be the weakest man from the weakest tribe. Yet God continuously proves to him that he is going to be a mighty man of valor. And the incredible thing is that God does the same for us. God didn't give up on Gideon, and God doesn't give up on us either. He is continuously there, waiting for us. Remember, I just told you guys that he calls you by something. And even if you don't follow his ways and you, you, you veer off on the left, God continuously is there for you, waiting for you to come back and, and realize that he is the way, I guess. Gideon doing this, though, shows us how weak he is. But after this, suddenly he decides that he's going to listen to God. And what Gideon does is he gathers 32,000 men to go to war with the Midianites. The thing is, is God tells Gideon at that point that that's too many men. Now, 32,000 men might seem, might seem like a lot, but the Midianites had an army of 135,000. So this is what God tells Gideon to do. He says, you need to make this army smaller and tell your, your army that if any of the guys are timid and afraid, they can leave. So 10,000 of them do. He's got 22,000 men left. But God says to him, Gideon, your army's too big. Watch how they drink out of the stream. And if they go down to the stream and they drink water by bringing it up to their face and drinking it in that way, those are the men that you must take to war. Only 300 men of the 22,000 did. 300 men to defeat 135,000. Now, when I read this, I had a question myself. Why would a loving God get Gideon to build up an army of 32,000 men to then break it down to just 300. Wouldn't the best possible outcome be for the 32,000 to go to war, maybe even 45, 60,000? Well, this is what I think. I think God knew that without the Gideon's men getting their strength from him alone, they wouldn't defeat the Midianites, no matter how big their army was. And God had to break down Gideon's army to just 300 men, so that those 300 men would not draw the strength from themselves, but draw their strength from God. Because that was the only way that they would possibly be able to defeat the Midianites. I also think that if the 32,000 men did go to war and did draw their strength from God, it would have been very easy for them to turn around and go back home and tell their wives and their girlfriends and their family that they were the ones that did it, not admit that God was the one that gave them the strength in that time. But with just 300 men, it would be impossible for them to defeat the Midianites of 132,000. So that's what God did. He took the weakest man from the weakest tribe with the smallest army, and they defeated the Midianites to show us that it doesn't matter how weak you may feel or how weak you may seem or the, the, where you came from, that but with God's strength and God's strength alone, anything is possible with his strength. A really good example of this is when the Israelites waited on, a mess- on the Messiah to come. They were waiting for a strong, fearless warrior to come and save them. But God uses weak people to do incredible things. 
He uses weak people to do incredible things. And what we see, instead of a strong, fearless warrior coming out, we see a poor carpenter from a town called Nazareth, a town, by the way, which no one, everyone said nothing good came from. And this man called Jesus went and taught about God's word. And he healed people. He calmed waves. <laughs> he raised people from life. And he fulfilled prophecies of what the Messiah would do. And at his weakest point, Jesus, the man who did all of these things, at his weakest point, he cries out to God and he says this to God. Luke 22, 42 to 43 says, this is Jesus speaking. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Jesus is asking him to take it away. He doesn't want it anymore. But then he says to God, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Listen to what God does for Jesus at this weak moment when he wants to give up. He, God says to him, or rather, the, then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. It was at Jesus' weakest point where he asked God if he could give up. Instead, God came and gave him strength. And that strength, by the way, led him to the cross where he died on that cross. But the good news is that he was raised to life on that cross. Or rather, he was raised to life. And when he was raised to life, he didn't just prove to us that we could get our strength from God, but also that we can be saved for our sins. You see, when he died and rose again, that resurrection covers the things that we've done wrong. <laughs> if there's something in your life that is, you feel is holding you back from the life God is calling to you to, Jesus' death and resurrection covers those sins. You have been forgiven for those things. And you're forgiven by, for those things when you accept Him into your life. Not only that, you, you, you get something so much more when God becomes part of your life. There's like this void that is, is filled in a way. Gideon was also strengthened by God at his weakest moments because God uses weak people to do incredible things. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this. It says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. Gideon was letting his brain decide what he could and couldn't do. And God came down at that weakest moment of Gideon's life, and he showed Gideon that he could be so much more than he could have ever imagined. And God does the same for us at our weakest moments. He comes to us and he shows us what, what possibilities we have. Isaiah 40, 29 to 30 says this. It says, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. This is a powerful message telling us that at our weakest moments, God promises us, in fact, that He will come, and if we trust Him, He will give us strength. It's often at our weakest moments where we surrender to Him. And it's in those weakest moments where we find strength from God. The strength we seek is the strength God sees. The strength we seek is the strength God sees in us. But how do you get that strength? How do you get that strength we're seeking, and how do you get that strength God sees in us? Well, it's actually a lot easier than you might think. <laughs> Step one, you need to accept. If you've never accepted God into your life, now is the best time to do so. And when you do, and when you ask Jesus into your life, and you, you confess that he's your Lord and Savior, and you, you follow his ways, things change in your life. Suddenly you'll be able to be impacted. The next thing you need to do, if you've accepted, is surrender. You need to surrender yourself over to him. You need to say to God, God, I am weak. There's nothing I can do without your strength. And when you do that, and when you surrender and you mean it, the next thing you need to do is you need to ask. You need to ask God to come into your life and show you and strengthen you and guide you. And when you do, and when you have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, and you have surrendered your weakest moments to Him, 
he does. He comes into your life and he strengthens you. Some of the most, the strongest people I know are the people who every day surrender and give over their problems and issues to God. Because they don't draw strength from themselves at those points. They, they know that the strength comes from the Lord. When you do these things, you go on a journey. And you go on a journey with God. Where He strengthens you. And guides you. And points you in the right direction. Don't do life alone. Do life with the strength God gives you. You see, the strength you seek is the strength God sees in you. And the strength God sees in you is the strength you receive when you surrender to Him. So now we're going to pray that we seek the strength from God and that we receive it in our weakest moments. Let's pray. God, I just want to thank you so much, Jesus. That at our weakest moments, God, when we feel like there's nothing else we can get, there's nothing else we can give, at those weakest moments where we feel like we just can't do anything more, Lord, that we know that we can come to you in those weak moments, that we can ask you for the strength, God, that we need to get through those times, God. Thank you, Lord, that your, your, your heart is open to us, Lord, and that you allow us to come and draw strength from you, God. Lord, I ask if there's anyone in this house tonight, God, that needs to accept you tonight and wants to accept you, Lord, that you give them the strength to do so, Lord. And also, Lord, I ask the people that need to surrender to you tonight, God, that they do that too, Lord, that we surrender all of our weaknesses and worries and concerns and pains and sufferings to you, God, so that we can draw strength from you, Lord, the strength you've promised us, the strength you gave Gideon, Lord, the strength you gave Jesus in the times when they needed their strength the most, God. Thank you, Lord, that you give us strength, Jesus, when we need it. In Jesus' name, amen.